Hi and welcome to the first of our Pensions Age video interviews. I'm Laura Blows, editor of Pensions Age, and joining me today to talk about emerging market currencies is Record Currency Management's Chief Investment Officer, Bob Noyan, and also their Head of Economic Research, Javier Coraminas. Now, pension funds in recent years have looked to emerging markets in particular as a means of diversifying their investment portfolios. Now, there's been a lot of talk about investing in emerging market debt and also emerging market equities. Why do you feel investors should now look to emerging market currencies as an alternative? One of the things that's not widely recognised in uh, investing in emerging markets is that often the currency return can contribute up to, say, 50% of the total return, both in equity and in bond investments. So if you look at, let's say, uh, a standard index like the MSCI uh, Emerging Market Index or a global bond index for emerging markets, 50% of the return historically for a sterling-based investor and also a dollar-based investor has come from the currency. So effectively, what we're seeing here is a, a, a different return source that we think needs to be managed independently and separately. One of the great things about currency as well is that you're not beholden to sort of market capitalization concerns. So if you're investing in an equity index or benchmark that to an equity index, you have to buy Brazil, you have to buy China, you have to buy, say, Korea in large quantities. You may not want to hold those currencies at that particular time in those quantities. So a standalone emerging market currency program will allow you to do that. And because of the convergence effect that emerging market countries are undergoing, that is, they're converging in per capita income terms to developed countries, that allows the manager to effectively weight equally to, say, perhaps, emerging market countries and benefit equally as well from that growth experience. So whether the country is small or big, doesn't really matter if they grow sufficiently fast enough, they will experience the same amount of real appreciation uh, in the currency, and investors can, can capitalize from that. I think there's an, an, a very interesting phenomenon uh, that has been picked up by a number of uh, uh, academics and market professionals, uh, and that is this. Uh, uh, investors globally, particularly in the, in the developed world, are seeking opportunities for return around the world. And uh, some have concluded that the fast-growing, developing world is the place to allocate your assets to. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's turned out uh, that the link between economic growth and equity returns is very, very poor. In fact, it appears to be non-existent. And that means that uh, the answer to the question, should I allocate capital uh, 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 or where should I allocate capital in the world to achieve superior returns, is the emerging market equity an answer to that question? Unfortunately, the answer is no. And we believe that the currency, in fact, is the, is the investment vehicle by which you can more efficiently exploit the growth phenomenon of the faster growth in the developing countries compared to the developed countries. As Bob quite rightly points out, there is a high degree of correlation between uh, emerging market equities and developed equities, and to a certain extent that's normal. We live in a highly integrated globalized economy where a lot of emerging markets depend for their growth on Western consumers. So it makes sense that those equity risk premium are to a certain extent linked. That means the investor looking to capitalize from the emerging market growth story may not be as well served employing equity as your sort of underlying driver instead of currency. When we talk about uh, debt, it's a similar story. In a sense, currency is what we could call very short-term emerging market debt. So if you buy emerging market debt, you're getting the same thing you're getting from currency. What you get from debt as well is you get duration. And we probably argue that this is not the best time to get duration, especially when emerging market growth is still relatively high and inflationary pressures are, are mounting, duration is probably not the thing you want to have now. So on all counts, emerging market currency satisfies the sort of return that one can expect from long-term convergence, and that's established by a wide variety of empirical and theoretical research. And it puts into question the fact that the traditional asset classes may not be the, the best way to capture that return.
Uh, there's an additional issue uh, specific to debt indices that investors should be very wary of, and that is that uh, the last uh, four-year experience in the world have taught us that the most prolific issuers of debt are not necessarily the ones that you want to lend your money to. And if you look at the way debt indices are constructed, they tend to be overweighted to the issuers, to the excess issuers of debt. And those are the ones that historically have tended to cause problems. So we think that there's another issue with debt indices that make then the currency story, the EM currency story, an attractive addition or a complement to your already investing in the emerging world through the equity and the debt indices. So looking into the practicalities now of investing in emerging markets, is it too simplistic to think of emerging markets as one single block or are there important differences that need to be considered between the different countries? I think emerging markets have historically been considered as a one block, sort of the emerging market countries, and they all behave similarly. What we've seen recently is that, in fact, there's quite a lot of variation among emerging market currencies. So some currencies in Asia are more export-oriented and, and manage their currencies in a particular way, try to dampen the volatility. Other countries have much more um, free-floating currency regimes, and that means that uh, investors need to take that into account, especially uh, through their manager selection, in terms of which currency regimes they think will probably come into play. Uh, different particular points in the cycle. So, uh, we, we, you know, when uh, risk sentiment is positive, we probably think that currencies in Asia and Latin America will probably outperform uh, others. And in fact, when then risk aversion uh, sets sets in, then probably you want to be looking at some of the more uh, managed currencies in Asia as a protection against uh, further risk aversion and unwinds in asset markets. Whilst all these countries are very, very different in terms of their socio-economic structures, their political systems, they are now uh, an, an, an great, or they consist of a great group of peoples that aspire wealth creation and to converge in their material living standard to ours. So irrespective of these systems, they want to uh, join the ranks of the developed world. And that aspiration, we think, will slowly translate into appreciating currencies to our real value of currency in the developed countries. So irrespective of the country, the aspiration of the peoples is the same. And then the beauty is, because they are different, but they aspire the same, you can actually exploit the phenomenon in a diversified manner. So a lot of emerging market countries have been known to intervene quite heavily in currency markets there. How could that affect investors' strategies? Uh, we think that by and large uh, the, the, the intervening in currency markets is not necessarily restricted to the emerging market currencies only. We see, for example, uh, the Swiss National Bank, we see Japan, we see developed uh, uh, nations also intervening trying to manipulate their currency for certain policy goals. Uh, what we do see is that in the end, mostly, these uh, uh, policy measures undertaken by central banks smooth out paths that are laid down for certain long-term objectives. So they are dampening volatility, which in a way is something that helps our investors. So if the central banks target, for example, uh, um, uh, lower inflation through a particular policy, that will help us because these policies tend to be achieved over multi-years, which makes then actions and reactions by the market more predictable. So it helps us, in effect, manage the portfolios better because they are reasonably credible uh, players in the market with uh, medium to long-term goals. So if you understand them, you can achieve your portfolio investment goals easier, we think. I think one of the important developments of the last 10, 15 years has been, in a sense, the achievement of monetary sovereignty in emerging market uh, countries. By that I mean most countries now can issue or are able to issue short to long dated debt in their own currencies. That means they've effectively eliminated the previous currency mismatch problem that they had, 
which often triggered capital flight and currency, and currency crises in a lot of these emerging market countries. So by achieving that monetary sovereignty, they're actually now much more closer institutionally to what the developed world achieved, say, 20 years ago. And that gives us, and most investors, in a sense, confidence in the future that this newfound stability will therefore want to be preserved. And therefore, uh, institutionally, emerging markets are now much more stable because they have an incentive to be much more stable as well. Uh, I, I think there's a an, an, an final point to add here, and I think it's quite crucial to, to, to understand. Um, this is following from uh, Javier's point about the, the set, let's say, the maturation of these uh, developing countries. They are now macroeconomically in a much stronger position than they've ever been in the past, which means that they can drive policy from their own perspective, and they are less exposed and less beholden to market pressures. And you, I, I think you may contrast that to now, for example, the efforts of certain central banks of developed nations. They're finding it very, very difficult to implement policy because they have run out of firepower. They've run out of ammunition. And uh, it makes, in a way, the, the, the developing countries much more credible investments long term because we understand what it is that they want to achieve and they have the firepower to do so. Okay, there's also been a lot of talk lately about so-called currency wars. How do you feel that affects investing in emerging market currencies in particular? I think emerging market currencies have certainly been part of the so-called currency wars. I mean, after all, it was the Brazilian finance minister who came up with this term. And what, we, what he means by that is that certain emerging market currencies are having to live with stronger exchange rates simply because uh, Western central banks are trying to inflate and depreciate their own currencies. And to a certain extent, uh, that's a natural corollary of what we would expect should happen if the global imbalances problem needs to be solved. So we will need, over time, stronger emerging market currencies that will trigger consumption and domestic demand in those countries. So that's part of the long-term solutions to the global imbalances problem. Now, uh, what tools uh, emerging market countries use to try to smooth out that transition to higher exchange rate is really the, the key issue that managers uh, need to understand. But overall, you know, I think emerging markets need to learn to live with higher exchange rates. And I think for their own long-term good, that's probably something they recognize as well. Okay, so we've spoke about the advantages of investing in emerging market currencies and the practicalities in doing so. But what about the downside still? What are the challenges and the risks for investors here? I think that uh, at the moment I wouldn't specifically uh, uh, answer the question in, in, in respect of the EM currencies only. Uh, we think at the moment there is a uh, an, an, an generalized risk aversion that, that feeds through the behavior of all risky uh, investments, including emerging market assets, including their currencies. And there are a number of catalysts for that. And at the moment, notably, we have uh, the, the, the stresses in the Eurozone that, that make investors wary around the world from parting with their capital and placing it at risk. Now, if you look at just the fundamental story of the emerging market uh, uh, countries, and you contrast that to uh, countries in the West, the developed nations, then on balance, we conclude that the prospects for the, the, the development of these emerging market countries is still intact long term. And that even in the near term, they're possibly better prepared to weather the storms that the global economy uh, occasionally unleashes on the world. And most recently, for example, we've seen uh, uh, as the, 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 the emerging market assets sold off and some of the currencies sold off in recent weeks, we've seen that there was intervention on the part of central banks and policymakers uh, in order to stabilize their currencies. And they could do so because this time around, in contrast to previous episodes, they have actually the means to stabilize their economies. And, and project policy in a more proactive way, as opposed to the West that is now very much at the mercy of whatever it is that the market decides to do. Now, some have argued that emerging market currencies are currently overvalued. What would you say against this? 
Well, I mean, certainly some countries uh, have strong currencies at the minute, but I can easily point to others that, that have weaker currencies, so, uh, and we're probably going to appreciate it in the short term. But I think the general point is that it's difficult to measure valuation from traditional metrics, such as purchasing power parities, for countries that are on a convergence path, like emerging market countries. So in a sense, if you just look at purchasing power parity, they're all undervalued at the minute, and they can only get stronger if that convergence continues. So at the turn extent, I think this is a, a long-run uh, story about emerging market convergence leading to stronger currencies in real terms. And it's something that's happened for the developed universe as well. So if you look at the yen 30 years ago, the Deutsche Mark 100 years ago, those countries, those currencies, sorry, have appreciated more than their inflation differentials would imply. That, that is, they've appreciated in real terms throughout those periods. So it's a pretty well-observed phenomenon, I think one that applies as well to emerging market currencies over the long term. No, I think what you, what you also want to realize is that, uh, and this is an innovation of record, we don't necessarily look at individual emerging market currencies against, for example, the pound or against the dollar. What we do is we try and gauge what is the average value of, let's say, the developed block of currencies, and we contrast that to the average value of the developing block of currencies. And then you can see that as a block, that developing currency block is much cheaper in real terms than it is the developed currency block. And what we are exploiting then is the convergence of that developing currency block to the developed currency basket. That is what we are exploiting. So it's not about individual currencies necessarily, but it's about one universe against another universe of currencies. And we think that in the medium term, we expect a, a convergence return, if you will, of something in the order of 2 to 3% per annum. And finally, how would you say there is a sufficient return for the risks in investing in emerging market currencies? Um, I think if you invest, say, in the broadest uh, emerging market uh, currency indices, it's about 20-odd currencies in there, and you narrow it down to the most liquid ones, we think there are about 13 to 14 currencies that are the most liquid that you can actually trade easily for the sizes that you know your clients are probably looking at. Um, that return is probably in the order of 2-3% per annum, as Bob mentioned earlier. And we run currently a volatility of 6%. So that's pretty compelling relative to, say, your, your equity investment in emerging market currencies, which probably has a higher return, not that much higher, maybe one or two hundred basis points higher, but gives you 25% volatility with severe drawdown periods. So in a sense, a, the risk-reward in emerging market currencies is, is compelling, and also the fact that these currencies are, in a sense, managed or smoothed by emerging market central banks helps in the sense that they're not going to just let the currencies fall off a cliff. Uh, you know, 40% equities can definitely do that. And companies can disappear, but countries and currencies don't really that often <laughs> at least disappear. Yeah. Uh, in addition, I would like to just add that um, uh, if you look and you disaggregate the indices that investors use to invest in emerging market debt and emerging market equities, you tend to find that they're horribly concentrated in terms of then uh, country risk and company risk. And that is because a huge swathe of the opportunity in the emerging world is not yet publicly available. So for example, it is not possible to invest in China and exploit all of the opportunity that China offers. Now what we then offer through our product is through the currency, you're investing essentially in the ultimate share of the nation and you get a diversified then approach to exploiting that particular opportunity as opposed to concentrating that in debt markets or in specific uh, equity markets. So you're getting a more diversified approach to exploiting this phenomenon, which sits very well, we think, in addition or uh, uh, as a complement to your emerging market debt and equity strategies. My thanks again to Record Currency Management for talking us through the opportunities that investing in emerging market currencies can provide. And thank you for watching this video interview today, and I hope you join us for the next Pensions Age broadcast. Thank you.